It'd be, uh, it'd be exciting to hear folks in our church, you know, um, most important thing, what happens in church is people coming to faith in Christ, following Him in baptism, and uh, making disciples. That's the most important thing. Um, but, I, but I will say as well, learning how to handle finances is part of discipleship. And so I, 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 I think it's a good thing um, as people give testimony that they were able to pay off debt and stay out of debt. That, that too is, is equally is, uh, important. And so, amen. Thank you for that, brother. And thank you for leading you and Orquita's leadership on our Spanish FPU class. This Sunday night, or tonight, I should say, tonight at 5 o'clock, well, before you drop your kids, or as you drop your kids off for the student ministry, um, come in. We're going to have a night of prayer. And uh, it will go from 5 to 6. And uh, I want to encourage our men and our women, but I want to talk just to our men just for a second. What, what does God want from the men of our church? Does he want you to be uh, strong, creative, courageous, innovative, uh, educated? And Paul will say this in 1 Timothy 2, verse 8, I desire that all men pray. That's God's desire. So I want to encourage our men and our women uh, to show up tonight, 5 o'clock, for our night of prayer. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you if you're able to make it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the worship, all that you're doing in our church. We don't take it for granted. We know that even as we speak, we can think of Oscar and Terry are gathering uh, uh, on their, on their um, couch there, praying for us as a church body. And Lord, no doubt there are others praying for us as we gather. And so, Lord, answer their prayers, our prayers that we've offered this past week that you would speak to us through your word and make us more like your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Kintsugi is the name of an uh, ancient form of Japanese pottery, kintsugi. What do they do? It involves uh, joining together broken pieces with, with either gold or, or precious metals. They liquefy it and they, they join those broken pieces together. It, it literally, kintsugi literally means golden patchwork. And the, the artist will take those broken pieces of pottery, such as cups, bowls, or plates, and they put them together, and rather than hiding the flaws from the pottery with that liquefied gold or, or other precious metal, it actually ends up highlighting the cracks in the pottery. I, I showed a picture of it there, and you can find this in museums throughout Japan. The, the, in Kintsugi pottery, the, the weakness or brokenness, we would say it this way, is not hidden, but rather it's showcased for everyone to see. It, 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 it's, it's, allows, it's allowed for everyone to be able to look at what has happened to that pottery. You know, God's ways are a lot like Kintsugi pottery. Only He doesn't put us in a museum for people to stare at us. He says, I want you to take that brokenness, and I want you now to go out into the world and to use it. Uh, Paul will write it this way in, in 1 Corinthians. He will say this, that God chose what is foolish, that God chose what is weak, that God chose what is low, what is despised. And Judges chapter 7 presents Gideon like Kintsugi pottery with all his brokenness on display for everyone to see. For this, for this is the reason why, in God's plan, weakness is the way. That is the way we are to live our lives. And so I've titled our message this morning, Why God Uses Weak People. Last week from Judges 6, it was, when does God use weak people? Today in Judges 7 is, why God uses weak people. Every year, the, the Midianites and the Amalekites would come into the, to the nation of Israel right during the, the harvest season. They would come in like locusts, and they would wipe out all the crops, and they would steal all the, the newborn animals from the year before, looting and ravaging and pillaging and stealing. But this year is different. This year is different. Gideon is God's appointed leader. 
And so he's gathered 32,000 of Israelite troops. I think of this almost like a militia. These are not a well, this is not a well-oiled machine. These are men who kind of have handcrafted swords and, and, and spears of various lengths and sizes and different shields and kind of a, a hodgepodge of a, a military brought together. And they're at the a spring called the Spring of Herod, H-A-R-O-D. We'll find out next week in Judges 8 that the Midianites that they're going to go up against, there are actually 135,000 strong there are 32,000 Israelites encamped at the spring of Herod. It's not by accident that the author of Judges 7 describes the spring of Herod, for the word Herod means trembling. If there's anything we know about Gideon and 32,000 Israelites who are about ready to go to battle against 135,000 Midianites, it would be they are a trembling group. But as the commander-in-chief, God says to General Gideon, you know what, you still have too many people. I I want you to tell, I want you to gather all 32,000, and I want you to say to them, if you're fearful, you can go home. I can't imagine this. You know, we we know the end of, we know how Judges 7 is going to end. But if you're, the, if you're Gideon and you're standing in front of 32,000 men at the spring of trembling, while everybody is literally trembling, knees are knocking and hands are, our palms are sweaty and everybody's heart rate is elevated, and you say, okay, if you're fearful, you can go home. And you're hoping that's like, you can go home, and everyone kind of looks down over his glasses like, you better not go home. And one person goes, he's like, okay, we can do it, we'll be all right. And a dozen. And then all of a sudden, the dozen was like a mass stampede for the exit door. And by the time all of them kind of faded off into the distance, or at least, at least went back to the tent, that 32,000 Israelites had now become 10,000 Israelites. 22,000 had left. And then in verse 4 of Judges chapter 7, God says, you know what? 10,000, that's still too much. too much? If Gideon's a a wise general, he's already sent a scout or two ahead of him. He knows how many there are. The the passage will describe for us in just a moment that the camels are like the the sands of the desert. 10,000 is is still too many, and so God says to him this, I I want you to go down to the brook, to to the stream, and whoever Whoever gets down like on their hands and knees and and laps down like a dog, um, I want you to set them to one side. And those who come down to the brook and and they kneel down and they take their hand to the water like this and drink it in this way, I want you to set them to the other side. And when he does that, Gideon notices that he's got 300 men that drank this way and he's got 9,700, 9,700 men that drank this way of the 10,000. And so, I don't know, maybe he would be thinking something like, okay, well, we'll send the 300 home. And God says, no, 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 I want you to send the 9,700 home. Now, I don't know about you, I have heard, like, like great preaching, I would say, maybe imaginative, but nonetheless, something that's rousing. I have heard rather imaginative preaching as to why only 300 men, why God would choose those 300 men. Things like this. Well, you know, God doesn't want to use fearful people, so he's going to send all 22,000 home. But you already know who Gideon is. If God is going to send 22,000 home because they're fearful, wouldn't he also send, wouldn't he also not have sent their leader, Gideon? So it can't be that. I've heard great preaching on, well, God wants to use mighty warriors, and so these warriors came down, and they, they, were, on, they were alert, and they were uh, on task and on guard, and they, they kept their eyes to the horizon, and so God wants to use mighty warriors. And, but do you realize how Gideon's going to attack in just a moment? Right? Those, those 300, they're not going to have a spear, they're not going to have a sword, 
all they get is a torch, a pitcher, and they yell. So this has nothing to do with like the great military genius of Gideon, and we're just going to tackle, you know, 135,000 men with 300, a well-oiled machine of 300 soldiers. So here's the question, why did God whittle this army down from 32,000 to 22,000, or to 10,000, and then to 300? If it's not because of fearfulness, and it's not because we just need mighty warriors who are going to do the job. Well, the answer to that question is found in verse 2. Judges chapter 7, verse 2, it reads this way, The Lord said to Gideon, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand. Why? Lest Israel boast over me, saying, my own hand has saved me. Drop down to verse 4. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Take them down and I will test them. The, 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 The very first the the very first circumstance as to why God uses weak people is for this reason here, that God uses indisputable weakness so that He alone receives the credit. This is why God went from 32,000 down to 10,000 down to 300 people. It had nothing to do with the the fearfulness of the 22,000, and it had nothing to do with the military prowess of the other 300 men. It had everything to do to demonstrate to people who are going to be watching both inside Israel and outside of Israel that there is one God, and it is He and He alone who has the ability to give the victory for His people. We are, we, we are good at covering and compensating for our weakness, are we not? I think at times we may even be oblivious or unaware of our weakness. But God is teaching a new generation, right? There's these, what happens is this, the book of Judges is a cyclical book, meaning by that it's happening in cycles, and, and God will deliver the, uh, the nation of Israel through one of the judges, and then a, 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 a period of, of time happens, and another generation arises that has only heard of what God has done for their great-grandparents in the deliverance and the exodus from Egypt. And so what God is doing in each and every generation is He's showing to us our indisputable weakness. Why? So that He alone can receive the credit. Gideon's weakness is revealed. Look at verse 9. The story continues, that same night the Lord said to Gideon, arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Purah, your servant. And you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hand shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. He went down with Purah, his servant, to the outposts of the armed men who were in the camp. He was on the outside, and and the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east lay along the valley like locusts in abundance, and their camels were without number, as the sand that is on the seashore is in abundance. When Gideon came, behold, a man was telling a dream to his comrade, and he said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and behold, a, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian and came to the tent and struck it so that it fell, and it turned upside down so that the tent lay flat. And his comrade answered, This is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given into his hand Midian and all the camp. And as soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped. The author is making it very clear that Israel's enemies are like locusts. The, the camels, uh, maybe that, that, that kind of sandy, deserty brown color, that if they actually, from a distance, they blended into that Middle Eastern desert. And a Midian man receives a dream from God. It's not impossible, but it is highly unusual for a pagan man to receive direct revelation from God. Nebuchadnezzar gets it. The the king whom Abraham and Sarah lied to, he gets it. This Midian man gets it. 
And he, he likens Gideon and Israel, the Israelites' militia, to a loaf of bread. I don't know about you, where you keep the bread in your house. It seems like we keep the bread in two different places in our house. And I'm not sure why we keep it where we do. I'll, I'm sure I'll find out at lunch why we do. <laughs> but there are times when I'll reach to the top of our fridge to pull down the bag of chips or whatever, and all of a sudden, what happens? I feel like a loaf of bread is coming down on top of me, right? It's, it's like hitting me in the head like... I'm just thankful it's the loaf of bread and not like, a, I don't know, a can of spaghetti sauce or something. Right? There's, you're not fearful if bread falls on your head, is my point. There's, there's no fear in, in, in alarm when, 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 uh, when a piece of bread gets, gets thrown. And yet here in the story is this barley bread, this barley loaf, which would have been a very small loaf, it was the type of bread a poor person would have eat, eaten. It's representing all of the nation of Israel. It's tumbling. And, and don't think of this like in a movie, like where it's a loaf of bread that's like massive coming down the, the, the side of the mountain. It's, it's literally a loaf of bread, and it takes out all the tents of Midian, and to which the man goes, this is, this is Gideon and his, his army of Israel. Let me read verse 15 as we continue. Verse 15, again, it says, when Gideon heard this, he worships, and he returns to the camp of Israel, and he says, arise, for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. And he divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put trumpets into the hands of all of them, empty jars with torches inside the jars, jars, and he said to them, look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, Blow the trumpets also on every side of the camp and shout, for the Lord and for Gideon. And so here is the second circumstance as to why God uses weak people, and it is this, is that God defeats insurmountable odds. Why? So that He alone receives the honor. Like when you're reading this, you're not to be thinking, okay, I'm Gideon of some sorts, and I've got to kind of go up against whatever my Midian is. The idea is this, is that God is placing us in circumstances and situation in which He alone gets the credit. He alone gets the honor. That, it's been said this way, that you and God make a majority. That one plus one typically is less than anything else, but when it's one plus God, now that's a majority. That was true for David over Goliath. It was true for Moses over Egypt. It was true for Elijah over the 450 false prophets that a minority becomes a majority with God. That is, whenever God is in the equation, the impossible becomes the possible. The impossible becomes the probable. And Gideon's response to learning, uh, to learning uh, what God is going to do would be, we, we would be wise for it to be our response as well. Because what does Gideon do when he hears this? He worships. For us, what do impossible odds often produce? They produce worry, anxiety, fear. But what is God intending for insurmountable odds in our lives? It's to produce worship. Right? And worship can, worship can express itself in a variety of different ways. Worship isn't always triumphalistic. Worship can be sorrowful. Worship can pr produce depths of sorrow. It, it worship, worship, what it worship does is it's recognizing that if anything good is going to come of it, it's going to come from whom? It's going to come from God. Geographically, this is the location uh, from where these Midian, so the Midianites are coming down from down south and Here's the Amalekites, and they, according to Judges, they would come up alongside 
uh, the Dead Sea here. They would come alongside the Jordan, and then they would cross over, and I think the battle was somewhere up in here. The only reason why they didn't come up through here is those Philistines that you hear about, that, that's, that would have been this territory. So there's no reason to have to fight through the Philistines with their mighty chariots when you can just kind of go this way and then cross over the Jordan and steal the lunch money, so to speak, from the nation of Israel. One more, one more I guess I have one more uh, map. So this area here is just a blow-up of this square. So I just showed, this is a, uh, there's the Sea of Galilee right here, and then if you go way down, I guess right in here would be the Dead Sea. And so this is where they're crossing over um, and where the, where the battle is taking, taking place. So there's the Spring of Herod, there's Gideon and his mighty men, and they're going to surround them, and eventually we're going to find out that those, the Midianite army primarily starts heading this way, back across the Jordan River. So geographically, this, this, that's the location. In this third scene, right, we go from, we, we, we go from the initial scenery of uh, 32,000 to 22,000 to 300. That's kind of scene one in Judges 7. And then the second scene is when Gideon is, it kind of uh, lurks down to the edge of the camp. That's the second scene or the second act if you were watching a drama. And the third act then reveals the third circumstance as to why God uses weak people. And it is this, that God orchestrates the inconceivable so that He alone receives the glory. And I am reading this in verse 19 through verse 21. Judges chapter 7, verse 19, where it reads this way. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. There's, in, in Old Testament, you've got three watches. You have the first part of the day, the second part of the day, and the third part. The middle watch, so in the middle of the night, when they had just set the watch, and they blew the trumpets, smashed the jars that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars. They held in their left hands the torches, and in their right hands the trumpets to blow. And they cried, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Every man stood in his place around the camp, and all the army ran. They cried out, and they fled. So the middle watch is the middle of the night. What happens when you're in a deep uh, stage of sleep and all of a sudden your alarm goes off? It happened to me this past Friday morning. My alarm went off early and all of a sudden I, I kind of jolted. I was like, okay, where am I and what am I doing and why did my alarm just go off like that, right? You're, you're disoriented. Th this is exactly what is happening, happening to the Midianites and those in the army, right? They're, they're disoriented and probably the, the flickering torches coming from three different uh, directions appeared larger than they were in reality. The pitchers breaking and the voices yelling caused Midian and Amalek to be completely disoriented as to what was happening. Perhaps, I don't know, perhaps Midian thought that Amalek, Amalek had double-crossed them. Or that Amalek had double-crossed uh, Midian. Because we, here's what we read in verse 22. When they blew the 300 trumpets, the Lord, Yahweh, set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army. And just like when, when Gideon dismissed his, his 22,000 from the 32,000 and, and one went and two went and then all of a sudden it was, that trickle became a deluge out the kind of the backside of the camp, no doubt this bloodbath happened in a, in, a, in a similar way. It was one man fearful and disoriented because someone comes up behind him, startles him, and he takes his sword and, 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 and takes it to his man, and all of a sudden now, blood is going everywhere, and swords are flying, and all of a sudden, everybody thinks it's every man for themselves, save yourselves. But behind all of that, what the author of Judges chapter 7 is saying this is, the Lord did this. Yahweh did this. God is the one who is doing it. And then in verses 23 through 25, it appears that those 10,000 men had been sent home. Maybe they had just been sent back to their tents, we're not sure. But it appears that now those 10,000 actually begin pursuing the fleeing Midianites. 
they, they capture and they end up killing two generals who we'll learn about more next week. And Hebrews chapter 11 tells us something that we never would have thought about Gideon. Like in our wildest imaginations, I never would have, I never would have added this adjective to Gideon's name, but Hebrews 11 does, and it reads this way. After, after going through the lists of Abraham and of Isaac and all the, the, the various individuals in the Old Testament, at the very end of Hebrews 11, it reads this way, and what more shall I say? And in good Baptist preacher fashion, they add some more. For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, his Judges 9, David, Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, and were made strong out of what? Weakness. They became mighty in war. They put foreign armies to flight. that what God is teaching us is that weak people can maintain their weakness and still exhibit great faith. Like, I like to think that my weakness eventually goes away, and then I have strength, and then I have great faith. But what Judges 7 in, in Hebrews chapter 11 is saying, no, 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 you actually, out of your weakness, you demonstrate that great faith. No, no, I thought I had to get rid of that, weak, that weakness first. No, 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 no. It's out of that weakness that that faith comes. Because here's the, here's the entire point of Judges 7, right? Here's the one big idea, that God doesn't use us in spite of our weakness. God uses us because of our weakness. Right? This, and this, this shouldn't be a surprise to us. Because Paul will say this in 1 Corinthians, consider your calling, brothers and sisters. Not like the calling to the job you have, like your election, your salvation. Consider your calling. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. And not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being, why, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And so Gideon went through what he went through, why? So that Israel could not say that they had any hand, that they did not add any finger to the, to the scale to kind of tip it in their direction. God was saying that the only hand that was, going to, that was going to tip the scale was going to be the almighty hand of God. And the weakness that we are living through and experiencing and brings tears to our eyes and keeps, causes anxiety in our heart and keeps us up late at night is for one reason only, and it is part of, is to say this, that where God says, I will be the one who gets the glory in the end. David Powlison writes it this way, that weakness is a most unusual door into all the ways God enables us to be strong an unusual door, that weakness brings God credit, that weakness brings God honor, and it is weakness that brings, God's, that brings God glory. And so he places us in the circumstances that he does, why? For his credit, for his honor, and for his glory. Is it possible that the life you have lived for the past 30 years or 60 years or whatever age you are at and you just have said to yourself over and over again, life is hard. It's just hard. And you've got the, you've got the scars and the, the, the war wounds and the kind of the tattoos of life to demonstrate it. It's just hard. Could it be 
that one of the reasons why life is hard the way it is is so that in the end, when you gather in heaven with all the other myriad of saints, is that you will give your voices to all the other thousands and millions and perhaps billions. And as we stand around the throne of God, sing praise to the Lamb, and we'll all be there for the same reason, because none of us were able to get there initially and maintain that faith in the first place. That part of the weakness we live with is so that God alone is the one who gets the glory. And so your anxiety isn't because you're a weak Christian. Depression isn't because you're a a weak Christian. Your parenting or grandparenting isn't because you've been a bad person or the struggles in your marriage, but rather because God is doing something in all that miraculous broken pottery and the only thing that's holding it together is the golden grace of God Almighty. His name was Sir Edwin Landseer. He was a British painter of wildlife. If I showed you some of his paintings, you would recognize them. But Landseer's, one of his most famous paintings is actually not in a museum at all. It's in a Scottish pub, inn, tavern in Scotland. Lancer was staying there for the night, and he was eating breakfast the next morning. And as he was just kind of taking in the scenery there on the, 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 the shore there in Scotland, he was listening to a fisherman tell a, a fisherman's tale. And if you're a fisherman telling a fisherman's tale, you're going to use your hands, right? Because you want to talk about how big that fish is. True story. As he's talking, he's gesturing with his hands, he accidentally knocked a cup of tea out of the waitress's uh, hands. And that tea splashed against the newly painted white wall of that inn. The man was so embarrassed, and Lancier's watching all this go on. He's, he's apologizing to the waitress. He apologizes to the owner of the, of the inn. And then Lancier walks up and asked if he could make something of that stain. Lancier painted a, a beautiful portrait of a Scottish stag, a deer, with that white canvas wall from that stain. The stain became the centerpiece of something that was beautiful. This isn't the only time that Landseer did that. In fact, there, were at least, there at least is one other occasion that history records that Landseer painted another wall painting. Again, taking a, either a crack or a stain of some kind on the wall and turning it into a beautiful uh, painting. It's, it's as if Landseer was just kind of looking around, trying to find the blemishes, the stains on the walls that, in which he occupied and he turned it and would turn it into a, a gorgeous painting. Landseer's only copying the master painter himself. You see, since the dawn of time, the master painter has been taking weak and imperfect blemishes, spots, stains that we find so embarrassing that are the skeletons in our closet that rattle around and cause anxiety and guilt and shame and God is saying I'm going to take that broken pottery and I'm going to bring it back together again why to demonstrate that I as the master painter the master, the one who brings it all together, who can bring from shame a beautiful masterpiece. You see, God is in the business of taking weak people and using them for His credit. 
And so you have looked around, maybe even at this body, this church body, and you have seen others with greater gifts and greater talents, and you have thought to yourself, yeah, see, God, God could never use me because I don't have that. And what God is demonstrating in Judges 7 is, no, 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 you're the perfect person. Like, I'll actually use that. I'll use it for my credit, for my honor, and for my glory. Why? Because God does not use us in spite of our weakness. Brothers and sisters, that God uses you because of your weakness. Why? So that all may boast that there is one true God. Let's pray.